so welcome to uh, today's panel, Creating Iconic Characters and Creatures for Film and Games. Uh, we're going to be talking to three amazing artists. Uh, we're all alumni of uh, the school whose students are up showing on the screen right now. Um, before we get into it, I, I, for me, whenever I can, I'd love to know a little bit about the people that we get to spend some time with, uh, people in the room, and it's you. Uh, so I'm just curious, uh, who here is starting to get into or has been set to using Freedom in the workflow? Cool. Anybody just want to show up Okay, cool. Um, so those of you who are using 3D, are you using that in, who's using that in the production platform? Like you're making characters for games or, you know, assets. Like that. Who is using 3D as for an illustrative tool? Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. And that's the really cool thing about 3D and kind of where the tools have come these days is the lines are really getting blurred. And, you know, software like Zebra and you know, all of you guys use becoming far more accessible than it would say in, you know, eight to 10 years ago. Um, like blocking things yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So my name is Adam Hartzell. Um, I have the distinct privilege of being able to host a lot of men's live streams, interview fantastic artists like the people who are with us today. Um, and what I would like to do is just briefly introduce you guys, but then uh, afterwards, I'm going to have you guys talk a little bit about some of the things that you worked on that you're excited about. So uh, first, immediately to my right is Jared Krzyzewski. Um, and... To do the fans. Yeah, keep it. All right. <laughs> um, Jared is, I, we'll get into more when we've done, but Jared is um, one of the projects he's most recently known for is uh, the designer of Godzilla for Godzilla vs. Spawn. Um, and then just next to Jared is in Sharp. You know, she's made some characters for a few small projects, one of them you might know called Love, Death, and Robots. And has also did some work with Riot, so we'll get into that in just a little bit. And then at the end also is Ashley Stegen. Ashley did some cool stuff, including, uh, was it was it right out of school that you were at Legacy? That's correct. Wow, so right out of school she's at Legacy Effects. I don't know, I'm making stuff for the men, Lauren. Yeah, um, you know, pretty, pretty cool stuff, and and now um, designing amazingly grotesque and awesome um, aliens for for a really cool game that we're going to talk more about. Um, so with that, um, I I think we'll just stay with you, Amy, and uh, not Amy, sorry, Ashley. We'll make our way back in reverse. But Ashley, you can just take a minute and just kind of tell us a little bit about some of the projects you've worked on, um, and what you know, maybe just one thing that you love about what you get to do. Yeah, one thing is hard. But, um, <laughs> hi, again, I'm Ashley. Um, I went to Nomen School of Visual Effects in Hollywood. Uh, I worked at Legacy Effects. For those of you who don't know, that's originally used to be Stan Winston Studio. So I got to work with a bunch of people that make practical effects and animatronics such as Jurassic Park and Terminator and all those things that we grew up loving and enjoying. Um, so I got to work with people that basically built my childhood. Uh, doing rapid prototyping and 3D printing, which is something I didn't bring at Nomen, but I got to learn on the job. It was super fun, so our job was for something like The Mandalorian was getting concept art and modeling it over someone who was actually going to wear the suit. So I made the big layer in suit. There's a couple of cool joys and animatronics that we also built for the show, including the wonderful Grogu, aka Baby Yoda. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, part of my job that, that is amazing is being able to work with also other amazing artists and being a part of something kind of bigger than yourself. Because um, it really does take a worry when it comes to creating full TV shows and with iconic characters and um, bringing all that to life and on the set. So. Awesome. I gave the bear make with me, guys. I'm here and it's really slow. Um, so it's still loading up some of uh, Ashley's work. But um, let's move on to Amy. Just tell us. That's that really existential 3D work, just why don't they? Um, so, Amy, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and um, some of the projects you've been working on? Yeah, so currently I'm looking on the collectible side at Riot as a freelancer. So, I work high res um, for 3D printing, and um, so it's mostly just sculpting in ZBrush and then uh, preparing it for prototypes. But before that, I did a lot of work in game cinematics um, at Blair Studio. I didn't even at other commercial studios, but uh, I 
I'm mostly just in high resolution and preparing it for animation. And it'll start like from the model and all the way to texture. I can look delicate. Um, yeah, and a lot of work on love death robots. Also, so. Boop, 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 boop. Hi, uh, I'm Jared. So for the last five years, I've been a freelance concept artist. I've been working in the industry for 12 years as a uh, character and creature concept artist. So uh, I make monsters all day, and that's rad. And um, I spend uh, pretty much an inordinate amount of time thinking about monsters <laughs> and creatures and creature anatomy and uh, things like that. And I've been... Um, been very blessed to have taught at Nomen for nine years, and um, I'm also doing the Creature Corner stream uh, for Nomen as well. So if you tune in Tuesday night, you get to see me make an ass of myself and uh, make some monsters in the meantime. So it's really fun. Uh, some projects that I've worked on that are coming out um, very soon are uh, Megan, the trainer for that just dropped, and I helped design the doll for that. Uh, very fun trailer if you haven't seen it. And then um, some other things next year is going to be crazy. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 uh, and um, uh, Black Adam, which is also coming out very soon. I have the fortune of working on that. And then uh, coming very, very late in 24, uh, Godzilla vs. Kong 2. Been, uh, been very amazing, uh, blessed experience. And um, primarily I work in uh, 3D or 2D. Uh, it depends on what the client wants, but um, to, to sell the final creature, um, I will use 3D as a base and paint on top. Awesome, thank you, Jared. Uh, then I should mention as well, I know that Ashley, you're getting ready to take over the Archipedia stream. Yes, I'll be doing also Tuesdays. So if you want a giant stream of characters and creatures, uh, you can watch Jared and I stream back, back to back. It's awesome. Also make asses of ourselves, creating awesome characters and whatnot, and hopefully getting input from the community itself. At least that's what I'm planning to do with the stream, this game. You know, the community involved with uh, designing characters and taking it from also what Jared mentioned, 2D to 3D, because I also work uh, in a very similar fashion. Yeah, one of the superpowers that Nomen developed during the pandemic when all we have is virtual series of live stream content. And so uh, Jared's stream as well as Ashley's upcoming stream are part of that. Um, if you want to know about those streams, personally, I love to join them uh, at night when I'm working on my own art. kind of just gives a nice art hang, it's an inspiration. Uh, you can text me the chat, and these guys will actually say something to you. It's really cool. Um, but uh, yeah, follow Nomen on social media. You can get more about the last streams we're doing. Um, and earlier, I didn't mean to alienate anyone who is not using 3D. My point in bringing up the question is I was curious to know who here has not yet gotten into any sort of 3D medium from your art, but you were curious about it, perhaps because you're seeing some of the job postings out there for what if traditional can get 2D illustrate type roles. A lot of studios are now saying, 3D skills a plus, or we get to know blend or zebra, or these kinds of things. So one of the purposes of today's stream is also to help to pull the curtain back a little bit and hear some professionals who are amazing illustrators themselves who use 3D tools uh, talking about how, um, yes, sometimes it can be technical at the onset, um, but as you get into it, you begin to use it as another paintbrush in your in your quiver, as it were. Uh, it's a very inspiring and empowering tool to use. So, I came back to you guys. Um, here's the question that I want to throw out to the three of you. Um, can you tell us just just briefly about sort of your origin story? Like, what was one of the first things that inspired you to get into art? Uh, leading, we'll start with you. Uh, well, I uh, books uh, very early on. I, I picked up William Harlow's book, um, the, the Age of Texture Terrestrials, or something like that. But yeah, this compendium, and that was like my first introduction to like aliens and monsters and things like that. And he had just taken um, different aliens from different books, and that was that was like my spark. Um, but I didn't I didn't uh, know this was a job or a, a career you could have until. Many years later, when I was working at Borders, a bookstore that used to exist, and um, I kept coming back to these 3D Art Masters books, and um, I said, "Man, this is what 3D is now! Like, this is what people are doing. I gotta learn how to do this." So that was like the spark. You know, kind of, I got to do this. This is cool. Awesome. And then, uh, really quickly, to kind of as a dovetail of that question. 
Um, what at what point did you decide that you wanted to like literally study pretty and go to school? Uh, well, it, it was kind of a, a spurring of events because um, the CEOs of Borders had come in. It was a big day. They, they, they were trying to permit me for managing stuff like that. And I was like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. But I overheard the CEO say that, oh, nobody will ever buy books online. <laughs> and I went, I got to get out of here. <laughs> and that was like, okay. So it was, it was like, I got to get out of here. And then I asked my cousin, I'm like, do you know any places to teach this stuff? Um, he sent me a list and it was at the top of the list. I'm like, I'm going here. And that's, that's how I ended up. And then like the first, my actually like the first day of my class, I learned the borders were shutting down. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. um, kind of what's, what kicked things off for you? Um, so I grew up playing TOS games and that all introduced me to video games and um, I maybe played basically too much growing up and on the side I did a lot of drawing but I never really made a connection between the two things until much later on I realized that you can do that as a job. So it kind of was just game addiction. <laughs> um, like the story for probably many people at this room. Uh, and maybe what was, what was or sort of what was the moment that you decided that you wanted to pursue a book after school on less education? Um, I had already had a degree mm-hmm. and I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, and I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft and I just said, well, this is it. I'm just gonna take the jump. Yeah. And then, um, how did you get connected to them after that? Because I think most people who already have the degree that they, they are looking for another school, per se, or... Yeah, I, at that point, I was working retail, and I would just spend every night on the concept art, dark art, that's like back in the day, and uh, there was no advertisements on there. And I just kind of kept looking at it for like two years, and then finally I decided to apply. <laughs> um, and, and, uh. yeah. um, my story is a little weird because last kid I went to uh, Steve Irwin so I was obsessed with animals I didn't watch any like TV shows really I just watched Animal Planet Love Data and Squad Beat and that was all I wanted to do um, so I didn't draw in because that was like my big thing in art when I was a kid was I just enjoyed drawing you know dragons and animals and person things sorts of things um, and so, you know, again, I, well, I always love movies. Jaws is my favorite movie. I was like, how do they train shark back in the day? But then I realized, oh, it's a puppet. It's like a giant puppet that does it word of the ocean. It's awesome. Um, and so I, I always had this love for film and cinema. I just never knew that there was so much work that meant behind all of it. I don't know. It's just something you don't think about as a kid. And then during high school, uh, I wanted to pursue art a little more, and I found all of these Noman DVDs, which were the Tara and was a Tara Whitlatch one. And if you guys don't know what Tara Whitlatch is, write it down and go over it. It's sweet. Um, so Tara Whitlatch, she does amazing creature anatomy and animal anatomy, and I was like, I need to learn how to draw all of this, and she had a DVD. So I ran to my dad, and I was like, Dad, here's DVD. It's called this Noman thing here to be by and I'm lying. He's like, what's Noman? I was like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. It's like, so I just want to tear my legs. She's on the one. Uh, and so my dad was the one who actually looked up into Noman and was like, Ashes, it's like a school. And it's in Hollywood, which isn't that far away from where we live, because we're in LA. I was like, we should go check it out. And uh, it's who we did, and then I realized that there was this whole giant industry that I was completely unaware of. Um, and so, I started taking classes uh, during my school. I started taking individual courses at Nolan to work on my portfolio to get into Nolan. Because it's at the time, um, being in high school, trying to get into Nolan is not really a thing. Uh, I think I'm not supportive, but we're talking. So uh, I was one of the youngest students to be accepted into Nolan just because it was not common to come right out of high school to go to uh, a three year vocational trade school that's just about the effects. Um, so yeah, and the rest is pretty much history, and now I will also start teaching in Nolan and doing streaming. I'm teaching in front of ZBrush, so if you guys 
Come take that class. I'll be teaching it. Yeah, I think you were the first submitted. I was like, now we're. Now we're just telling you another We're going to take Paul into your high school six yeah. final yeah. time, but I always like to point our incoming high school students back to you and be like, it's grant zero. For high school. For high schoolers. Yeah. Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was made for me. Absolutely. Um, so I want to make sure that we have, and I really do want to encourage questions from you guys. Um, you know, whether whether you're a working professional presently, uh, whether you're seeking, uh, you know, to be a professional yourselves. Um, I enjoy doing these kind of talks because really it is, it's about giving you guys access to artists that are doing the work um, for you to ask the questions that you have. And I always can't stand it when I'm in panel. So we've got five minutes for questions now once they come up to the mic. Um, so I'm going to kick off the question time by, by posing a question to these guys. And then after they're done with that, I'm going to invite people to lie down. Uh, for the mic, ask some questions then. But being as the title of this panel is creating iconic characters and creatures for someone names. Um, we know that directors love to spur around words like iconic, new, want it to look just like this, it's something we've never seen before. Um, you know, and a lot of that is, I think, communication and interpreting what you're asking of you. But my question will be, what does, how do you translate that? What does iconic mean to you? And what are some things that are kind of like common, maybe common thought processes of the way that you start your projects to make sure that you are starting in a character or creature that is going to have to, it's going to, you know, put fully assignment essentially, but to give people something that will feel like. Um, so let's see, I'm not going to actually not see. <laughs> I have been great, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Because um, I think a lot of when you work with directors and, um, you know, tons of producers and things like that, who aren't necessarily artists, they all have visions. And a really common thing in the industry is everyone knows what they don't want, um, but they'll never tell you what they do want. And it's kind of your job to explore and tell people, go, yeah, I think this is a thing. Um, but it really varies a lot from project to project. So right now, um, I've been seeing a character artist for a video game company that works on the Alien franchise, so we do Alien games. So um, I, my job is the concept of new Xenomorphs and aliens in scope and for a game. So it's one of those things where it goes, okay, we want to make a Xenomorph. What are the things that make a Xenomorph a Xenomorph? But how do we make it new and unique? while also staying within the realm of that world, right? We are creating lovely, cute characters, we're creating creepy, guide your inspired creatures. Um, and how do we hold true to that while also creating something that's gonna be fun and different for players um, to interact with and basically shoot all the time. So, um, you know, it, it varies a lot from project to project as to, when it comes to character design, design is basically to fit some sort of form of function, right? That's what design means. Um, so it's really about understanding who is this character, what kind of story are we trying to tell? Even if it's something as simple as this character is going to get shot and killed, like how can we make it fun and unique to that player? Everything has a design and purpose and story. It's our job to bring out that intention uh, visually, for whether you're watching a TV show or a game, to be able to convey that properly to your audience. Um, so, yeah, I iconic is interesting. It's an interesting word. It's always thrown around when you're like, hey, let's make it cool. You're like, what is cool? Cool is very different to everybody. Um, what I find cool is very different from what how I love you make it quite cool. Um, so, I think a lot of what I have to offer as an artist is also just. If I get hired for a job, people want to see what I think is cool, because that's why they hired me, because it's my art, and it's the way I enjoy things. Um, so I think staying true to yourself as an artist is actually one of the best ways to be a designer, is because if you do stay true to yourself, you're going to get hired for the things that you enjoy doing um, as well. And I think through that and through your unique abilities, you'll get interesting designs. And I just want to ask Paul a question, because I know you spent I think everybody's different. I think most people start out drawing at some point. Mm -hmm. But I know that for you, both your, your 2D and your 3D skill sets are something you were constantly going back and forth. Yeah, I don't know if you see anything oh, on the oh, yeah, internet. <laughs> I'm too interested in you guys to let this thing do whatever it does. Because it's usually you like a little You talked about design and understanding the brief and bringing something to the table. What role does, two, does drawing or your 2D skill sets play? in that kind of a process for you? Do you start in 2D and go to 3D or tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so um, 3D sometimes can be a little annoying to start in depending on what kind of work you're getting to. I can sketch out something in pen very quickly and show my boss and be like, hey, what do you think of these ideas? Um, before you get into it, getting into nitty gritty 3D stuff. But the more I work in 3D, the more you'll understand 2D and then vice versa. So they're, they're mediums that work together. Because um, 3D is basically just a glorified pencil. Um, at the end of the day. It just has way more buttons than a pen. Um, and so when it comes to designing, I think it's really more about one budget and time. How much time do I have? Um, because, you know, for something that I don't know what he has, uh, for, so for something like that, um, you might not have a lot of time, so maybe starting 3D is a good idea because you can hit the front, the back, the side, you can flush out the entire character without doing a bunch of turnarounds. Um, you're just working on the one piece. And plenty of people need to see the front and back and side of things. And doing a model is way easier than doing a bunch of drawings of it. Um, so it really depends. If you're just trying to get out an idea and go maybe this, the sketch might be a good idea. If you're trying to flesh out a full creature to somebody who maybe doesn't understand how to read a drawing, if you're working with a director that's not used to seeing 2D sketches but wants to see more 3D stuff that needs more of a finalized clear line, uh, clear vision, then yeah, maybe 3D is the option. So it's really just about looking at the toolbox that you have and bringing it wherever you go and going, okay, for this job I need this tool and for this job I need this tool. And you know, over time and experience you'll learn what's going to work best for you. And sometimes it's a combination of things like 3D and then paint on top or doing 2D and importing into 3D. So. And then, uh, Aang, kind of what, what's, what's going through your head at the beginning of your process after you get your brief you to start and approach your work? Um, so, design is on my end, everything is done by the concept artist, so I don't usually have a lot of leeway on changing things or deciding how cool things are. Uh, sometimes there can be back and forth on it, like with Love, Death, and Robots, there were some creature problems, like the animation and stuff, and then you have to change the design on it. Uh, and in those instances, my, I work with my instinct uh, rather than vague directions. And most of the time, your instinct is going to be correct. Just do what you want to do, and it'll come out better. And it get approved. So, but um, but yeah, I really don't get to have a lot of say on the designs of characters. Well, I wanted to ask a follow-up question to you because um, I get to talk to a lot of character artists, and I also get to talk to a lot of people that are drawing and designing characters on their own and are aspiring to that kind of thing. And um, every character artist tells me it's you may have less leeway in terms of the design but it doesn't mean that it's any less creative task that you, you are designing, you are you're having to solve problems and generate creative ideas. Can you tell us a little bit about in that specific role where maybe you're not doing a concept sketch, but you're literally making the actual character, what, what is the creative process for you like? Um, I think I'm going to use collectibles as an example for this because this is the biggest one. So I will get usually a, a very I know it's a very clean sketch, um, but it's usually only from one view, and you, from that you interpret the gesture. So you are given all the outfit details, and like that part is already decided. But you have to make those poses work in three D and from all angles. It's very hard, and like the longest stage of this for me is usually just posing the underbody and fixing all the anatomy and then everything else comes on after that. But you can change those designs a little bit with the poses. Um, so in those cases, I would say that there is a lot of creative decisions on you to do that. On cinematics, it's a little bit different because you're stuck at t -bugs, But <laughs> And we're looking at a great example of that. We worked with a that we did for Riot uh, for our camp. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Um, it's so funny, you're just like, I don't have design things. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we'll finish up the question with Jared. Because Jared, you're, you're implying 3D as a considerable part of the process, but yeah. you're doing it as a concept artist. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I wanted to kind of address your, your original question, which was iconic. Uh, like, what does that mean? Uh, 
And as a kid, I was really interested in Egypt and iconography and uh, how they would they developed a language and a storytelling system just for images and and pictures and their pictures would kind of flow in and tell a story. So to me, iconic, the most simple form of that means icon, uh, which is something that's fast and easy to read. Right? You think about the Nike swoosh. Everybody knows the Nike swoosh. It's just a shape, right? It's just a very simple shape. Yet you know that shape. You know it immediately the second you read it. Right, so that's kind of what it means uh, in my head when I'm designing. I'm thinking simplicity, uh, readability, and then also storytelling. Where does this character creature fit into the story? Uh, one thing I recommend for any artist to read is Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. Understand like where usually if we're doing a monster, right? The monster fits in into the story and is usually mostly some kind of allegory for what the hero is going through, right? So the, the monster is usually a representation of the hero's journey, what their bad is, what their internal struggles are. The monster is the visualization of that uh, challenge. Or in like case of like a the peach dragon, it's a it's a protective kind of spirit or like a, a parental kind of spirit in there. So when I'm thinking, when I'm designing and I'm coming up with stuff, I'm thinking simple readability. Where does this creature fit into the story and the journey that the hero has to go through? So um, for me, uh, storytelling um, is is always most important. So when I get something, I always read the script if it's available because that tells me where this creature fits it. You know, if you're designing a creature, it's gonna show up to like maybe uh, a minute screen time total, depending. You did more than that. Yeah, a little bit more. A little bit more, but how many times have we gotten like, wow, we're not gonna see it until the very end. Yeah, to the very, very end, you know, and it's just a chat, you know? Um, but it all depends on like where that creature fits into the hero's kind of journey, because that creature is there to test the hero uh, against like whatever the their their journey would be. So if they need courage, or if they need uh, uh, to quell their temper, or if they need to uh, you know deal with it. Yeah, it's a good example. Yeah, having yeah. fears. They'll bring out new fears. Yeah, that creature is designed to do. Yeah, and, and so that's that's usually where I'm going is is uh, storytelling, iconography, hero's journey, uh, all those things, and then the design. As, as function has to fit into the picture. Could you tell that Jared's been teaching at Noma? I did that. Uh, all right, so lots of theater majors. So, <laughs> that was like, so my job is I get to be professional nerd and I get to nerd out these guys all the time. So I've got tons of questions and I have no problem with the time, but I would rather put your questions in now. Um, because I can work out some of my questions later. So um, what I think would be good, just so that we don't have to repeat people's questions, is um, if you don't mind teeny bit of stage fright just to come up to the mic and ask your question the mic so everybody can hear you, uh, we'll just form a queue and start taking uh, whatever questions we've got. And if you want to... Yeah, you can stage fright, you just ask that lovely minute. Yeah, Chris can bring the mic over to you as well. Yes, yeah. for all artists here, so none of us like, you know, except for Jerry, you're an actor. So, uh, but uh, I would say you know, if you have a specific member panel that you'd like to address your question to, please make that known. If your question is more general, I'll let one of these guys choose you know, who wants to answer it. My feelings will be heard and okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... All right. So um, my question is, what do you do with maintain inspiration to create creative burnout? Inspiration and love and passion, because I eventually you run into a wall. So what do you do to keep that love, that passion, the life? You create all the three yeah. answers. But, um, so for my, my actual professional work is usually in the realm of realism, um, whereas my personal work is actually very stylized. Um, and I went to do draw and all that stuff, so my pillar is a lot of 3D. And so in order to keep creative for out from uh, not happening. I try to vary the mediums and the styles that I work in because it creates challenges and it creates qualities. Having your own personal project too. Um, I got an art burnout not that long ago and I was like, man, I just don't really know what I feel like drawing or doing. Um, so I started reading a bunch of writing books and screenplay writing books. So there's also, it's not always just 
art. If, um, a Stephen King has a great thing where he says that if you're feeling creative, right? If you're not feeling creative, create. So it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, if you're not feeling like drawing, there are many other alternatives for you to still be productive in your creativity because you can find creativity and ideas anywhere. So again, I think watching Animal Planet all the time. So, you know, um, just being curious about tons of stuff that you don't know is going to keep you from burnout. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's great. Great question. Did any of you have something to sneak in on that? I'll, I'll just add that um, taking care of your body, um, like taking care of physical health, that like gives you an outlet while you're not being creative. So like go on a run or, or whatever your physical outlet needs are, like exercising or, or some kind of activity that's not sitting in a desk. So when you're exercising the body, uh, your mind is kind of like the best mode and it's building up. Uh, it's like get full some shower thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's because you're not, think, you're not thinking about it. You're not forcing it through a pit hole. So, yeah, take care of your body. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, at the Bryce is this big 2D 3D world. I think that when some sort of design background enters 3D world, they get learning by like a kind of bad lot of areas like Super Snake, Mom Lane, Blighty, special effects. So have you guys found um, that Spider Discourse also has designers with a specialist, as specialists or as generalists? And what would those specialists do be? Does that the mix sense? Good question. It's a really good question. Um, I'm, I'm a hybrid person. Um, so I design in 3D or I draw or I, you know, whatever the kind of situation calls for. Um, really, it comes down to like, how much time do I have? I don't have the time in a, in a budget um, to go through the look dead topology process, you being process. So I skip all that. Um, so you can do a lot with like high level textures and, and putting things on. So you don't have to go through that process every time. Uh, what's great about 3D is you can kind of pick any point in the process and just grab a snapshot or a render and just start painting on top. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on the project because uh, my job is more technical most time because I don't always just do concept. Most of my job is creating game assets. So I start from a high res and work low res and baking UV. So I do have to do like a whole lot, right? Because that's what my job calls for. Um, but if it didn't call for that, yeah, it, it, it's kind of about what if you're a really, really good painter and all you need are some cubes to block in some lighting. That's where you stop. That's fine. If you just can't get the perspective right, but everything else you're like, I can do it uh, with my skill sets that I have, that's where your future can stop. So it's really just more about how you use the tool for what you need and not get overcome and like overwhelmed by all the technical aspects that 3D can offer. Because it offers a lot. And there's tons that even me as someone who's very technical in their job, I don't use um, because it's just not required in my skill set. But there's tons to learn. So it's all about kind of, uh, again, it's like having a toolbox. You have tons of tools when you go to the job, you're not going to use every single part of that toolbox, but you have it just in case. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just, I'll address really quickly. I mean, the fact that all three of you are known in grads means that you may have the one particular area you're working in right now, but all of you have learned the Python. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the advantage of an education like that is, a lot of, then you guys, a lot of artists that I get to speak to and what I have at the school is they might be focusing on character art games, but they've learned a lot of aspects of the pipeline because to make great character art is not just about the characters, it's about having enough knowledge to set up the environment, lighting, and you know, knowing all those things, like they can get the same, it helps get that specialization across and help it make sense to whoever has to see it. So, you got to know the corners that yeah. you got to cut. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay. awesome. Next Thank question. You. Cool. Hey guys, uh, my name's Adam. Super cool, inspiring work today. Uh, I speak for myself, maybe others want to say, like, it's so cool, it's a little intimidating. Um, I do 3D worlds, like, kind of world creation right now, and I want to get in, like, a practice of just dabbling in some character creation. So, my general question is, like, What's a habit you recommend we can start to form to just like start this process? If we're like, I'm not in school, I'm just kind of doing it on the side. Um, and then Amy's focus question for you is like, how did you first get in touch with Love Death and Robots? 
<laughs> like, how that happened? I was already at Blur, and Blur is the studio where that originated. Wow. So I, I think I had been there for like a year and a half at that point or something. And uh, yeah, we would select certain episodes, like which short stories we wanted to do in the house, and then Blur be sent off site. So that's how I got started on that. Yeah. yeah. But I think for your other question, I would recommend just getting it to ZBrush and just like sculpting a portrait. Don't think about anything technical, just bring like the most basic interface, standard brush, clay tubes brush, that's it. And just move stuff around. Yeah, and if, if the if ZBrush is what's too complicated, they have something called ZBrush Core, which is just basic fundamental sculpting. So if you're really just looking to get into shape creation and getting your hands dirty and something, um, that's a great option for something that's a little watered down, and then as you get more advanced with your 3D, you can upgrade yourself to the full-on ZBrush. Blender's also a great choice. Blender's free. It's a community software. There's tons of people that use it. Everyone models a donut. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those things that you can start somewhere free. What I love about when it comes to even getting into 3D, what I actually really am not like sponsored by Blender. I just like Blender because you can sculpt in it, you can model in it, you can texture, you can rig, you can animate, you can light, you can render, and you can composite. You can literally do Google Pipeline. So if you don't know what you like, it offers everything for you to kind of dabble in. It's a bit of a jack of all trades of a program, and so you're like, I've never textured. Go ahead and try to texture in the free program and see if you like it. You might hate it. And then you'll realize like what things that you enjoy, and that's when you can start focusing towards. Okay, we'll get a lot of software related questions. We forgot all questions, and we need to know how to use the tools that we have. But uh, the philosophy at Noman is we were software transcendent. So, the um, great thing about a lot of free tools is if you are watching some awesome stuff from the ZBrush community about sculpting 3D, well, you're learning principles for sculpture. Um, what you have available as a tool is Blender. It's really just learning about what those controls are called in Blender yeah, for sculpting. It's it taking the same yes, it's over. Um, so it's never been a better time um, to pick up. Well, it is. When you're really the 3D programs, all of this is over there your game was, where's the button? I know there's a button, yeah. where is it in this program? That's all it is. And at the end of the day, it becomes a memorization game with like all buttons. I think Ash is right. Starting with portraits is a great way to learn anatomy. And, and then once you sculpt the face, pull out the ears, you got enough. You know, yeah. that's important, you got it even. Well, it was one of our first. Uh, mm -hmm. Projects that we did, and we teach ZBrush, and you sculpt five sketches of the character best. And I think it's important to not just, I'm sure you agree too, maybe it's like, don't just sit and noodle on one. Create one every day. Like, create a new thing every single day. Just, it, again, it's, it's the same. You want to treat it like a sketchbook. If you're sketchbook, you're not sitting off one page or doing the same thing every day. Right? You do characters, you do figure drawing, you flip the next page, you watch more sketches, you flip the next page, you watch. Treats 3D the same way. It's all about like repetition and practice in that thing. Yeah. So thank you guys. Great question. Appreciate yeah. it. So my question is a little bit off topic, but I'm more curious about your guys' opinion on AI generated art. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of really common. I mean, I think, I, I think, well, I think it's a tool. Um, I think, you know, there are obviously ethical concerns behind it um, that, that people have brought up at the Concept Art Association and so on. Mostly that it can't be copyrighted um, is, the, is the big deal right now. And frankly, there aren't enough laws. The laws that exist are, are there are no laws for this. So it doesn't, it's, we're not keeping up with the technology. And the technology will outpace us. Um, so I think the ethical concerns are, are great, especially if it's sourcing other artists' work and material and things like that. Artists need to opt in as opposed to we have to contact the company and opt out. Obviously, there are copyright issues. The other issue uh, is basically studios um, are also keeping up with this. And they're not going to let you put AI art into um, into anything, and that's because it can't be copyrighted. What I learned in copyright of working on Ready Player One 
is they had an army of lawyers who worked reached out to a bunch of people. And if one design was too similar to another, they would you would cancel it. They would say no. That we don't want to fight that lawsuit. Um, especially if you're dealing with the states of other artists or other IP or things like that. So it is perilous. Uh, that said, there's some really cool potential with it and things that are really unique and interesting. Um, but we all need to be vigilant about it. Um, the truth is AI is coming for everybody. It's coming for all jobs. And um, we need to be vigilant about that. But on the flip side, as a creator, as an artist, I have more faith in artists than ever because the, the ability to put pen to paper um, is unique and that is the human experience. Um, translating art from uh, what's in our head, what's in our experience, what's in our journey to something that's on the page and that's immediately readable uh, and it's an emotional connection. So AI cannot make an emotional connection. Um, so, you know, we need to be uh, vigilant and I think we need to, you know, pressure lawmakers to start thinking about these things. Uh, but is it the end game? We're all doomed. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I saw you do something really cool with AI on your streams. Yes, you use, you use it for reference. So we've already seen it jump into reference boards. So our directors are putting AI generated stuff into reference boards, but they can't say make bits because um, it might be sourcing other people's artwork. Can and so the artists directing? And guiding the eye in composition because AI yeah, just doesn't understand how to tell a story. Miss it, I think. Yeah. It's also just not to gloss on the subject too much. What I was going to say is that there's AIs that beat every person in the world at chess. We play the list of play chess. Just us. <laughs> so, yeah. It was an inevitable question, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's Hello, I have uh, reviewed the, like, gone out and learned more 3D and learned techniques because it's something I want to incorporate into my practice because it is more speedy for things to do to figure out perspective to create shapes. But as a beginner in 3D, constantly in my workflow, I've approached it, you know, if I was better at 3D, doing it in 3D would be faster. But since I'm a beginner, I know I can just draw it out faster. I know that, like, I could photo bash something, but trying to incorporate the learning into a process where you're trying to get faster. I was curious if you had any tips about actually incorporating it to your workflow and trying to become faster and faster. It's like that front-end investment on speed. I just, just drink a lot of <laughs> 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 I mean, I do. That's not the case. So uh, the unfortunate thing with that is what I will say is that um, speed at something is not actually becoming fast at it, it's actually just becoming a push at it. And the only way you become fitting at something is just by doing it a lot. So it just takes time to actually, it takes a long, it takes time to get efficient, so it takes not as much time. It's just the way usually anything works. I mean, your 2D stuff always runs the same way, and you're like, man, it takes forever to draw a circle and like this figure. And now you can block out character in grass blood, it's kind of two minutes. We have to treat it the same way, and again, I always try to bring the relatability of the media into what two yards can understand, because it really is the same thing. You're bringing in the same part of this. Um, so, as I know that that's kind of not an answer that you're looking for, but that is kind of the answer. Is uh, more time spent today it will just make you faster because you'll find the shortcuts and things that work for you. I have like small follow up. If you're talking about incorporating it more and more in just practice, is that in a personal project? Or are you willing to take that investment, that front and tech investment, on like something you're being paid for, or like a project? And you're explaining to yeah. are you tired out that you're like, I'm going to test out this new technique. It's going to take longer. But so that, that depends. It depends on if you have the time. Uh, there's plenty of time. So Gary and I both work at like the same place at point. And um, we work on films and game and games stuff, but we also work on almost 250 commercials a year. There's a lot of commercials. For commercials, you have no time to be like, I'm gonna play with this thing. You just have to do what you know works. Um, but for some stuff for film, like when we worked on uh, Suicide Squad, the James Gunn one, we did a bunch of experiments. There's this orange lizard lady that like dies in the beginning that I worked on there. We did all the prosthetics for her. And we did a bunch of experimentation um, on how to make 
purpose that is easier to apply and easier to create. But because we have the time to do it, that's why we're able to do it. So yeah, it really just depends. Obviously, if you don't have the time, do not let your boss be like, eh, I want to just play with this thing and then you're late for your deadline. So it's about making smart choices with it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Uh, hi, and uh, thank you for being here. My question is more about um, visual development and concept art. And how do you find art directors like yourselves responding to the um, 3D tools for iteration of the like character or creature design? Or is that still mainly a 2D focused thing? Well, uh, it, it's interesting because um, I, I see. I see it comes in waves. Um, I've seen everything from like napkin sketches get, get approved um, to it can only be a fully realized 3D model. Uh, example was on the Artens of the Galaxy Volume 3. James responded. Yeah, uh, responded uh, mostly to 3D stuff. So for them, it was helpful uh, being able to turn it around and say, like, look at this thing, what do we like about this? So. Um, every situation is, is different, and you just have to be flexible um, and, and just uh, you know, willing to shift at a moment's notice depending on what the director or the client is. Yeah, I mean, in the same project like The Mandalorian, you can show something to Doug Chang that's kind of a flock, and you will be like, yeah, I did it. Yeah, he, um, he, he, you understand because he's Doug Chang. Yeah. John Favreau needs, like, color. Yeah. Um, so I've made, uh, this is kind of a long story, but I think it's an interesting one. It's not long, but we sure. So John Favreau, we were working on Iron Monger, uh, for the first Iron Man, uh, my friend modeled him and did a great scale turnaround. John Favreau came in and was like, no, it was terrible, I don't like it. So I will get for your I don't like it. Nah, he lost his mind. <laughs> he left. And then the next day, or it was like the week later, he came back um, and wanted to see it again. And so what my friend did was to find the key shot, and he clicked and dragged a metal material onto the whole thing. And I came in and was like, I love it. It's awesome. It's perfect. This is the best thing ever. And, and you didn't change the model at <laughs> So the idea is some people just don't know how to read grayscale. And it's not a bad thing. It's not to say John Favreau is a terrible director. He's clearly not. It's just some people can read the sketch and some people need a bit more understanding. It's about knowing who you're working with. Uh, as to like how far you need to go that. So I always like bringing up that story. And then a quick follow-up is, if you were to bring this into the portfolio, um, would that just be showing a variety of work and tools in the portfolio, or would it be anything specific? Uh, I, I recommend uh, hitting the gamut, the range of probably like photoreal to stylized, because you never know where where we'll show up. So um, and it was nice to like, well, I did this, now I'm going to do this, and I'm going to show, maybe I want something for sideshow, or here's my, like, I'm going to aim for blur. I'm going to aim for Disney. I'm going to aim to find a studio that you like and start, like, uh, find a studio that you're North Star and be like, I'm going to aim towards that direction. Yeah, it's always good to be specific with stuff, but I think, I don't know if you wrap up, but, like, if you look at my creating work, and then you look at and you see, like, my tuning work, they're very different. Um, and it's, it, one, that's just me, that's just because that's what I like, but actually, the studio that I work for now, they hired me because they're like, you have a very large variety of things that you can do. Um, they love me because I sculpted all the sideshow collectible aliens, and they're like, yeah, you just built in into the room. I was like, yeah. But they're also like, you can also do this. It's too deep work. I was like, yeah. So, uh, I think having for is good, but as you can see also, all my stuff is paired. So I don't do anything again that I don't like to do. You'll never see me draw an environment because I don't need to hire for that. Um, that's not the same thing. Oh, people do them. Um, so yeah, I think it's about just staying, staying true to yourself and like what you enjoy doing and finding your work in that. Because that's why we're in this industry. We're here to do a job with us. Um, well, Ashley, you were talking the story about dragging, just dragging the metal material on the model for John Favreau because yes. because he's not Doug Chan and he needs more visual information. And yeah. being I saw you smiling, um, I'm wondering if you've had similar experiences. Yeah, I should have admitted it, but sometimes I'll get something rejected and I'll just show the same exact thing and then the inside it gets approved. <laughs> <laughs> It's just about whether you find a client like a good leader or not sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. You never know. That's awesome.
<laughs> awesome. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Okay, thank you. It's been a little bit off, but I really want to get into visual effects and so we need to really get my hands dirty and then so when you have a doing scene like you do the concept art and what's the between like when you had a doing first of like if you the post production if you wanna like compound it and add the 3D characters in versus what you're doing like what's the difference between the the workload and the art style and then just this itself. So maybe maybe I can answer that because I I I'm more of a technical artist than uh, I mean you are too for sure. But you're also pretty tricky stuff to get done. And you're a concept, so like what kind of like very kind of trade or see maybe like more technical most of the time. Um so for concept for example, like Jerry needs to model something so that way you can take a screenshot and can often convey an idea. Um, my job was about like, making a game asset, so two million colleagues of our artists will cannot go into our game. And then you also get, there's, you know, 10 xenomorphs that all look like that, so it's like 20 million polygons on screen, that would never work, right? So it was all about creating the low poly. Um, so my job, when it comes to visual effects for, and this is also for film as well, is it's about making models efficient rendering of games. Um, so it's a form of practical pipeline where you create a high res and then you create a low poly model and then you have to do baking and texturing um, on your off your UVs and somebody also has to be able to read it and animate it, which means the topology needs to be good. And those are all things that I worry about because I have a pipeline that's looking after my model. So I go, okay, if I'm making this scene the more, um, you know, the shoulder needs to be able to do this thing. How do I model it? So that way the animator later has enough quality to work with to make it feel fluid and good. Um, whereas, but not that one's, again, it doesn't, it doesn't mean one's better or worse than the other or anything like that. Just each thing serves a different purpose. Um, so for concepting, we're not worried about the quality at all. We just want to get what it looks like quickly so that we can visually explain it to the client. Whereas my job is, it needs to work from a technical aspect, maybe animating and then lighting and working in the engine and in game. So, in other words, you like to make the final model, is that thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, it's just a bit more of a technical weird process, which again, we all have learned to do at Nomen. Um, and that's kind of the cool part about Nomen is I could usually go to Nomen, but hey, do you know how to rig? I'm like, yeah, because we all learn this like weird pipeline, but then we all specify and go, oh, I like it doing X, Y, and Z of that pipeline. And that's the cool part, is there's tons of jobs that maybe people don't know about. Yeah, thank you very much. It's awesome, like, when you model it actually in the movie, right? Exactly the same, which is what I get. So thank you very much. Yeah. And that's a little bit I love saying about character and feature artists or production business. Like, yeah, I mean, they might do some sketching, but they make the thing that you see. Like, the concept artists, a lot of times, and Jared, I'll tell you, concept designers, uh, you know, more than half the stuff those people can get off the screen, but if you're a creature or a character artist, you're literally making it. I mean, that, that's cool for about probably, you know, it's also mechanic making or practical effects is the thing that may gets put on somebody's face or something, um, or gets shown in, and sits in somebody's bed and it's like, I'm a little bit, um, and there's always something cool about like holding something and something very tactile, so practical effects is always really fun. If, uh, if you like getting rejected a lot, you'll love design. Yeah, you're doing a Yeah, All right. Uh, I guess there's a question a little more for Jared. Um, so I'm not trying to steal your job or anything, but... Uh, 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 I love coming. Yeah. Come in. Yeah. Uh, come in. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> um, so I love creature design with a passion. I want to be a creature artist uh, that, uh, that makes the ideas concept art uh, yeah. in terms of creatures. Um, how do I get to be as fortunate as you to be as good as you to... So when someone's making a movie that has a monster in it or two, they're like, I want to go to this guy, you know? Uh, yeah, man, a little bit of luck and serendipity kind of went a long way. I, I have to... You know, I, I was a little uh, maybe naive about the odds of getting into this, and um, I didn't really understand that. And probably thinking I was better, uh, but I didn't understand that because I was like, hey, I'm convinced, you know, like it, it was, um, 
Uh, yeah, a little bit of serendipity. I just happened to be at the right class uh, with the right teacher, and um, that was my foot in the door. And um, but what I would say first is I'll take my class. Second, um, I would say it's repetition. Just keep keep doing what you love and do it over and over and over again. Do it all day, every day. Live it, eat it, breathe it, and and uh, never stop making it. Because I had to watch like every movie, read every book. You know, like absorb like you are a short circuit input feed me input you know i, I just you have to live and breathe this stuff man because i do I, I love this stuff so much and that's why i like with infinite amount of energy and abundance i'm like i want more you know so just if, if you love what you want to do and it's what you want to do pursue it with all passion because it will take you there thank you so much and that was a very Direct question, but I wanted to play it on top of. He says it's really lucky and serendipitous, but I think what you're doing right now is a really good example of something you're doing right. Is show up stuff like this. Um, our industry is really small. I I was taught by Jared, and then we ended up working together, and now the two like together. She taught me a bunch of stuff. It's a very small industry. So it's one of those things where, again, go to a class, uh, go to Art Cafe, go to Finger Drawings, go to go to the zoo, find um, other people drawing and do some. Make connections. Because if you don't know anybody, there's no door that's going to open for you. Um, but it's all about being open to the opportunities that are potentially there. So everybody here is already doing something right in that sense. Um, is talk to people. Like I said, we don't action type. I was joking. Um, so, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, just be open to discussing with people. And that's already a really good thing that you can do. I know we're all introverted nerds. Okay. Uh, we gotta, we gotta, we're all introverted nerds, so we can all talk to each other, and it's okay. Exactly. And it's, Jared's going to be demoing at the Noman booth today from two or you literally walk up and, like, look over his shoulder, walk we'll across the table. But um, it's great chance for you to see him do what he does. Okay. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say before our final question, I shouldn't say, uh, Ashley, you demoed yesterday. Jared is going to be at the Nomad booth number 1308. He's going to be demoing in ZBrush from uh, 2 to 4. And then tomorrow at the same time, 2 to 4, Amy will be with us. So if you want to see what these guys do, which is a really big part of it, right? Like just watch an artist do what they do. Um, you guys can stop at the Nomad booth. You can nerd out with them, you can nerd out with me. It'll be lots of fun. So we love to see that. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. You guys have a good time. Yeah, and our final most patient person in the room. Thank you. Okay. Hi, okay. first of all, I would like to thank you for being here and just like, I saw the channel. It was really helpful. And um, second off, my question is how did you feel like 3D modeling was the right thing for you compared to other art fields? That was a good question. Yeah, um, I actually I wanted to be a 2D concept artist for characters originally, and I kind of just I'm a pretty buffet with 3D, and it, 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 if I didn't like it, well, I didn't like it, but I ended up just loving it more than 2D. Um, because the problem solving is really different, and you kind of have more control, I think, overall, in the final outcome. So I'd say that's probably why I'm in that direction. Uh, uh, I'm kind of like, I'm sitting in class and, uh, you know, I, I had a hard time hurting mine. It was, it was really a, a struggle for me. Uh, but I saw someone working at ZBrush and I was like, what is that? I want to do that. And so I just by watching someone working, that was enough to be like, oh, like, I can feel the, the lights kick off, and that was my kind of like, ah. Um, and all, I, let's see, Ashley, did you want to come that? Yes, I mean, I have more Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the biggest thing is make sure you don't feel like you're forcing yourself to it because you feel like your fails is. Um, find something that works for you in it. It might not be your thing. There's plenty of people that I've been to know and was like, no, brainstorm, because I'd rather. Stick with 2D. That's totally important. Um, 
I think for me again, I like the the variety that you get, and I do really feel like the moment you get into 3D, your 2D is also just going to improve. Um, both will improve from each other because you just learn so much from one that translates to the other, and vice versa. It really is a huge symbiotic relationship, and usually when I look at 3D artists, you can kind of tell if they draw or if they don't draw. Um, at least from my perspective, I can usually tell. Um, it's just because that it has that kind of relationship, and for me, it makes you think about things that you would normally think about. It, there's a lot of things in 2D that you can kind of cheat that you can't in 3D. Um, so realizing your creatures that way, and understanding balance and form, and all those different things, um, and approaching it, it's just like. If you're used to oil, now you're going to try watercolor. It's kind of like, how do I take all these fundamentals that I know and apply it to something that's new? Um, which makes it really fun. I think it keeps it really entertaining and open, and it's constantly changing as like the tools that you can use for it. So. And I'll, I'll throw this out there because I know that, I mean, some of us in the room, I'm sure, live in LA and you're at the doorstep of a lot of these studios. But I realize that maybe some of you travel from out of state, maybe, maybe even out of country, maybe where you live, you don't have access to things like Lightbox. You don't have access to things like having a high population of industry artists around you. So um, this will sound like a plug for Nona, but I would say this whether I work for the school or not. I mean, Nona does watch the panel, so I'll have that. Um, but uh, one thing that Nona does that a lot of people, most people, don't realize is yes, we are a college. Yes, we are offering a paid education to people, but we are far more interested in helping you as an artist than just arbitrarily trying to just sell programs to get you to go to school. And one of the ways that we do that is if you reach out to Noman um, before you ever would apply, before you ever would get any kind of committal conversation, the very first thing that we want to do with you is to talk to you, to find out what you're passionate about, to, talk, to hear about some of the kind of jobs that you would like to do and why you might be seeking education. And most importantly, we will one-on-one -on -one look at your artwork and offer you coaching. Um, and if you're interested in applying to them, we will literally tell you what our school would be looking for, not just as a one-size-fits-all portfolio, but we would say, based on you and your skill sets, this is what we'd like to see from you, based on the kind of work that you want to do. All of that is upfront, no strings attached, and before you think that we're super altruistic and it's too good to be true, we do that because it helps the school. We want to make sure that everybody who gets into Nome is there because they know that this is exactly where they need to be, that they're hyper-passionate about this stuff. So on the front end, what we want to do is just talk to you about you and help you level up and help you find out what your next steps are. So if you're interested in that kind of mentorship, um, stop by the Nome booth. I would be glad, totally glad to help connect you. Um, but with that, I just want to say thank you to um, Ashley, Amy, and Jerry. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to stick around and chat about this stuff. We need to make room for the next group. But, um...